We now move on to questions to the Minister of the Environment, and I call Mr. Cackle Oshin. Minister. I recently organised a conference on the historic environment, which was held at the Playhouse in Derry last month. At the conference, I reaffirmed my belief that a well understood and well used historic environment reinforces the distinctiveness of our places and delivers a character which is attractive to investors and to visitors. It also gives pride to our population and helps to encourage our young people to remain and make a life here and contribute to the vibrancy of our society. Investment in our heritage through its continued use therefore creates a virtuous circle. I have therefore consistently attempted to fund investments in heritage which can turn this circle. This has, as members will appreciate, been difficult in the context of the constraints on departmental budgets. My department's budget for 2015-16 was reduced by the highest percentage of any department. Undaunted, I made a bid in the June 2015 monitoring round for funding for investment in heritage, but the executive did not agree to that bid. This meant that I was not in a position to allocate any monies to new or increased letters of offer for listed building grant aid in this financial year. I was, however, able to allocate 585,000 funding from the carrier bag levy scheme during this financial year to assist with repairs and maintenance of listed buildings that provide facilities for community access and use. With regard to the thatched building at McGilligan, my officials have been engaged with the owners since 2006, advising of the department's grant aid funding. New funding offers were available up until August 2014, and more recently with both the local council and housing executive to address the owner's situation. The owner of the thatched house in Garva received grant aid of almost £4,000 in 2014 for works to replace roof timbers. A further application was received on March last year for assistance for the rethatching of the roof. However, due to funding unavailability, no new letters of offer have been made since August 2014. Before we move on, can I remind the Minister about the two-minute rule? I thank the Minister for his answer, and I know he is aware certainly of the McGilligan case because he had visited there uh, last year, just before the election. But uh, he will also be aware of the human, of the, the human uh, side of that, an elderly couple who are living in that house, which is beyond, uh, should be really condemned. But is the Minister cognizant that uh, while this lack of funding is, not, is there, is that uh, we run a, a real risk of losing some of our vernacular buildings, including houses, uh, mills, schools, uh, uh, stables, and the like. Go and please, listen, Kota, Ash, and, and Kesh. I thank the member for that question. He referred to the the college on Seacoast Road in McGilligan. Yes, I, I am familiar with it. I did visit, and I've received one or two letters about that property as well. And as I've said, my officials continue to work with other agencies, most notably and most recently the housing executive, in an attempt to assist the owners of that house. They are an elderly couple, or sorry, an elderly brother and sister. And I think it's imperative that all agencies do all that they can to improve their living conditions. The members' wider concern about, I suppose, the prospect of us retaining and maintaining these valuable built structures is a concern that I share, and I know that other members of this House, and certainly members of the wider community, uh, will share. I think it's imperative that not only do we look to restore budgets within my department, or even the new department that will have responsibility for this, which will be the Department of Communities, but that we also look and continue to look uh, for other sources of funding to restore and maintain these type of properties. I think uh, under the new Department of Communities, which will also have responsibility uh, for local government, there will be an opportunity to create and explore new synergies. I think local government are well placed to identify uh, the built heritage they have within their areas and also spot opportunities to improve it and to maximise the benefit to their local economy, because it certainly does, and it has been proven that one pound spent actually by government on restoring uh, heritage buildings generates a further seven pounds spent in, in the, the wider economy. I think it, it's important that we do all that we can to re-establish funding for listed buildings. Call Mr. John Dallet. 
Uh, Mr. Principal, Deputy Speaker, would the Minister agree with me that the incoming executive has a mammoth task to face in terms of acknowledging that in the past much of her built heritage was lost through uh, unapproved demolition, bombing campaigns, pure neglect, and a lack of appreciation that her built heritage is very much part of our history? And would he uh, ensure that when he closes the books of his department, he places a memo on the top of the file marking priority? I thank uh, Mr. Dalit for that question and, and, and indeed agree that there is a mammoth task ahead of, of whatever minister takes over this in this regard, and indeed the executive and us as an assembly in terms of retaining, maintaining and promoting our built heritage to, as I've said, maximise its potential for today's economy. I think we can look at other jurisdictions and learn from best practice in this regard, despite the setbacks that we have uh, suffered here, despite the, the, the years of bombing that got rid of many of our buildings, and despite the inability of government over a number of years to invest in restoring and retaining uh, that built heritage that we have over the past number of years, last year excluded when, there was, when the cupboard was bare and there was no money to put into it. Prior to the, the financial year previous to that, DOE had spent £4.5 million uh, on built heritage, and we saw tremendous <coughs> results as a consequence of that. I think it is something that should be prioritised. That's why I think local government has a central role to play, because they will prioritise this, they will drive that, and they will need executive support to do so. Call Mr. Jim In respect of the McGilligan case, does the minister accept that at the time when there still was funding available, it was feet dragging by a departmental official, which caused the deadline to be missed, and therefore the department itself has responsibility for the state of neglect into which that property is fast falling? Uh, thank you, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker, and I thank Mr. Alistair for that question. As I said in my original answer to, to Mr. Hoshin, my officials have been engaging with the owners of number 360 Sea Coast Road since 2006, including advising them to apply for listed buildings grant aid funding. There was a failure, and Mr. Alistair is quite correct to identify this, during the summer of 2013 by officials to reply within a reasonable timescale to some emails and indeed for the area architect to be available by phone. And this did fall short of our high customer standards. My officials have reviewed the reasons for this and taken steps to improve procedures and ensure that nothing like this happens again. I do not, however, believe that this materially impacted upon the ability of the owners to submit an application for grant aid prior to my department ceasing to issue letters of offer in August 2014. As I have said, my officials had been advising the owners for some eight years prior to that date of the their potential to be successful should they choose to do so. Call Ms. Anna Lowe. Thank you, Mr. Principal, Deputy Speaker. Uh, minister, uh, I would like to ask the Minister um, if the DOE website on uh, uh, listing the historic building at risk uh, is back on online because there was an article last November by uh, detail to say that it's uh, been taken off. The website. Uh, thank Ms. Lowe for that question, which <laughs> I don't think she'll be surprised to know I'm unable to answer. Right now, I will uh, establish if this is back on the website and if it isn't, ascertain why it isn't and when it will be, and make sure that it is up as soon as possible. It's important that all these matters are as accessible to as many people as possible, and that what we do as, as a department and what we do as a government is uh, as transparent as possible as well. Call Mr Chris Lowe. Question two. 
In November, I decided to put a hold on the snares order because I was aware that many are opposed to the idea of using snares in any situation due to concerns about animal welfare. However, I am also conscious that there are two sides to this debate. Those who support the use of snares consider their use essential to assist countryside management practices such as farming, game management and reducing pressure on ground nesting bird species. The order would supplement existing regulatory controls and would place the following new technical requirements on snares and how they should be used. All snares would be required to be fitted with permanent safety stops. All snares would need to be fitted with swivels to facilitate twisting action by the animal caught by the snare without causing damage to the animal. The order would require that snares should not be set in a place or in a manner where an animal is likely to become fully or partially suspended or of risk of drowning, for example, over water courses. Snare users would be required when conducting their daily checks to ensure that the snare remains free running and to remove or repair the snare if it is not in such a state. And lastly, the use of drag snares would be prohibited. It will be a requirement that snares must be firmly staked into the ground or firmly anchored to an object in an appropriate manner so that the snare could not be dragged away by an animal caught in it. I am currently in the process of meeting with groups who hold very strong views on both sides of this issue, and I will use this process to decide the next steps. Mr Little, first supplementary. Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker, the Assembly Environment Committee voted to ban the use of snares in 2009, and yeah, polls yeah. have found that 87 per cent of UK vets believe snaring is inhumane, yeah, and yeah. three out of four people in Northern Ireland support a ban. Can I ask the Minister, therefore, why then he has failed to introduce a ban on the use of snares in Northern Ireland? Yeah, yeah. Uh, thank the member for that question on my failure. And while the, the, the member points to a vote by the Environment Committee in 2009, it's my understanding that this Assembly voted in 2010 not to ban uh, snares. Like I said, there are groups on both sides of this argument with strong and valid views. I'm currently in the process of meeting with those groups, of listening to those groups, and that is what will dictate my next steps on this matter. I think all members uh, will be aware of some of the harrowing images that those opposed to the use of snares have put out there, and they are very impactful and indeed had such an impact on me that they led to me deciding not to move this order in no November, which I don't think that those groups view as a failure on, on, on my part. However, those, some of those who advocate the use of snares will say and point to this order as actually making more humane snares uh, the, the, the par for the course and that the, the bad practice that has been highlighted in some of those harrowing pictures is something that they also want to see eradicated. Uh, it's, it's not an easy uh, the, the decision to make. It's, it's not going to be my own personal instinct would be that I'd, I'd like to see them banned, but these decisions have to be evidence-based as well, and that's what I'm in the process of doing, gathering more evidence. Call Mr Danny Kennedy. Good for Mr Principal Deputy Speaker. Um, and of course, the minister is wise to avoid all traps and snares, uh, but, um, uh, and he will understand that. But uh, given that there was a, a substantial uh, consultation period involved uh, with stakeholders uh, over a number of years, why has the minister taken cold feet on this one? I, I, I thank Mr Kennedy for that question. I'm not sure if I've taken cold feet or I'm just careful where I'm putting my, my, my feet on this one. Uh, yes, there has been extensive consultation. I personally haven't been the beneficiary of such a consultation and personally hearing the views of individuals and groups on this subject. I think it is a very interesting subject and indeed I had a very interesting meeting recently with a group who would advocate and support the use of snares and have serious concerns about what they call or would describe as my failure to, to move uh, the, the snares order in the first place. I found that uh, meeting quite enlightening and informative. I'm not sure I found it 100% persuasive, mind you, but like I said, I will consider all arguments put forward. 
and uh, that, that's how I'll decide how to proceed on this one. Call Mrs. Dolores Kelly. Uh, thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker. I wonder is the Minister minded to bring forward legislation uh, regarding uh, the cruelty uh, to circus animals and that's to prevent it, obviously? <laughs> I thank the member for that question. Animal welfare is uh, a matter for the Department of, of Agriculture. My department is, however, responsible for the legislation governing entertainment licensing. This legislation has been in place for approximately 30 years, and in July 2014, I announced a review of this legislation. The Entertainment Licensing Review Group carried out the review and reported its findings late last year. It made 36 recommendations for a future system, and they have subsequently been issued for consultation. 26 responses to that consultation have been received. The review group's report included a recommendation in relation to circuses. In response to the consultation, comments were received about the misuse of live animals for entertainment purposes, and a suggestion was made that entertainment licenses should require applicants to comply with the Welfare of Animals Act, Northern Ireland 2011. Following the consultation, I met with a representative of Northern Ireland Says No to Animal Cruelty in November to discuss circuses with animal acts and entertainment licences. I have subsequently asked my officials to liaise with the Department of Agriculture about circuses with animal acts. More detailed proposals for the future entertainment licensing regime are being developed taking into account the comments received during consultation. <laughs> Where are the animals? <laughs> Call Mr Paul Given. Uh, question number three, Principal Deputy Speaker. My department continues to take a range of actions to reduce deaths and serious injuries on our roads. We focus on the key causes of road casualties and on groups which are overrepresented in the casualty figures. The Road Traffic Amendment Bill, which recently completed its passage through the Assembly, makes provision for a new drink driving regime and a new graduated driver licensing scheme. We will now develop and consult on a significant package of subordinate legislation to implement the new arrangements. The principal objectives of road safety advertising and associated public relations activity are to contribute to reducing the number of people killed or seriously injured on our roads and support the achievement of road safety targets by researching and targeting the main causation factors that contribute to road traffic collisions, raising public awareness of these main causes and changing road users' attitudes and behaviours. I have also recently commissioned two new campaigns. The first is a social media campaign specifically addressing the various issues in relation to mobile phone use while driving. The second campaign will deal with young driver distraction, particularly when carrying passengers. Both campaigns will be launched in the coming months. My department also continues to provide a range of resources and schemes to be used by teachers to allow them to improve road safety behaviours in children and young people. I recognise the continuing challenges of preventing road deaths and serious injuries, and as such, my department will continue to address these issues through various activities. I can assure you that I remain fully committed to continue working with my executive colleagues, with the PSNI and other stakeholders to improve road safety and to reduce casualties. Call Mr Given for a supplementary. Principal Deputy Speaker, and I know it, it goes without saying that one death is one too many, uh, and every effort does need to be taken to try and reduce the number of people who lose their lives and, of course, those that are seriously injured. So I welcome the legislative uh, developments on this area as well, and obviously public awareness is going to be key uh, to having effect to that. In respect of the 20 miles per hour issue, which uh, has been debated publicly recently, um, can the minister assure the public uh, that roads are identified for 20 miles per hour limits on the basis of wanting to save lives and injuries, as opposed to revenue raising, and that we do need to make sure the public are supportive of these proposals because roads are being targeted for road safety issues and not for revenue raising exercises. I thank the member for that question, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker. And while I do retain, and my department retains responsibility for road safety policy when it comes to matters such as speed limits, 
and road safety measures. It is the Department of Regional Development who uh, retain responsibility. That is not to say that we do not uh, liaise on these issues, and indeed the Regional Development Minister is a very valued member of my ministerial working group on road safety. Uh, who, and we'll meet again at the end of this month, and we have already have, or sorry, the end of next month, and we already have a pretty full agenda. The issue of 20 mile per hour zones is one that I welcome, but the member is quite right. It has to be areas where this can work and where this is needed, where we actually need to encourage or force on these occasions motorists to slow down because, as things are, they are posing a risk to the lives of other road users, be it pedestrians, children going to school, etc. A similar situation applies, I suppose, in relation to speed cameras, and this is something that I have raised uh, with the PSNI on more than numerous occasions uh, with regards to the location of, of speed cameras. I believe that these should be located on dangerous roads as opposed to just busy roads where many members of the public and perhaps I believe with some justification, few these as, as cash generators, and uh, that's not what they should be there for. They should be put in places to save lives, reduce collisions, and reduce the carnage on our roads. Call Mr. Cockle Boylan. I approve. Thank you, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker. I'm going to take this opportunity to record my sincere sympathy and condolences to the families of. Andrew Gass and Mark Hutchinson, and indeed all seven fatalities, uh, the families of seven fatalities killed on our roads up to date. Um, but could I ask the Minister, Minister, is the message getting out, and I appreciate we're bringing forward new legislation, but clearly does he believe the message on road safety is getting out, and would he consider working with other departments to try and introduce a driving simulator into the colleges? Was clearly we are having a major problem, and there's families and extended families and communities out there now who are suffering, and we need to try and eradicate uh, road fatalities for our market. Going to ask and Colta as and question, I thank the member for that question. I would never rule out anything in terms of what I would do to further or to make our roads even safer, and I'm happy to work with anyone in order to do so, even executive colleagues <laughs> in, in this regard. Like I say, we do work closely with other departments. I work uh, closely with other road safety partners, such as those in the emergency service, and, and the suggestion of, of the member is in, indeed a good one, and one that might perhaps be worth exploring further. It's certainly not something I would rule out. I think, in terms of getting the message out there, we have done and continue to do all that we can in terms of TV advertising campaigns, back of bus advertising campaigns, other initiatives like, I said, giving a toolkit to teachers to educate children, sending our own departmental officials out to schools, funding community groups, even the, the GAA and young farmers clubs to do their things with, with young people in rural areas in terms of promoting road safety. So a lot has been spent on getting that message out there, but I don't know what could get the message out more effectively about the need for road users to be more careful than those harrowing figures, for example, that seven people have lost their lives on our roads already this, this year, this month. And any uh, death on the road is, is tragic. But whenever there are young people involved, and there have been many times already this year, it, 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 it hits home even harder. And I think that in itself should be enough to make <coughs> other road users sit up and be aware and take more responsibility for their own behaviour on the roads. Thank you, Mr. Principal, Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Minister for his uh, response, very detailed. But, however, the Minister will be aware that in my own constituency we lost a six-year-old schoolboy uh, this week, Joshua Kelly, um, outside a, a school in Yutnard. But the question I ask the Minister is, why? Why does it take a serious accident and then a fatality, in my case, Joshua Kelly this week, before 
any department, not only Mark's department, but other departments, do anything to prevent such a thing happening again. That's the public perception is that nothing will happen until somebody loses their lives. We have it, unfortunately, here. And I ask the minister, why, why, why? I thank the member for that question, and I extend my sympathies to the family of that young victim. One can only imagine the pain that they are going through at this time. And people will ask, why, why wasn't something done before? And I know, time after time, when I am remonstrating still with transport NI officials about the need to implement or introduce traffic cam in, in areas. Often I will ask, and often residents of that area will ask, do we have to wait until someone loses their life before something is done? I see Mr Alistair behind you, and I know an experience he had had making representation for a constituent in terms of a school bus route being cancelled, and, and, and sadly life was lost that perhaps could have been avoided had that not happened as well. I, I, I think, therefore, while we do recognise the constraints that departments have in terms of budgets, real efforts must be made to, to prioritise areas or spend in areas where there is real potential a threat or, or risk to life. Call Mr. Daniel McCross. Thank you, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker. Uh, Minister, living on a busy stretch of the A5 between Straban and Oma, I have witnessed firsthand the consequences of dangerous roads and dangerous driving, with a number of fatalities fail, uh, happening just a few minutes from my own front doorstep. Can the Minister outline the impact of cuts to his budget on expenditure on road safety? I, I thank the member for that question. And, I had, and my previous answer, I suppose, been cognizant of the cuts and pressures facing all departments in terms of what they can spend and where they can spend it. But I'm saying that severe cuts have been made to my department's budget allocation. And this has meant that in allocating the remaining DOE budget for 2015-16, I had to review all elements of spend, including road safety advertising and the educational budgets, to ensure that resources were allocated in line with my priorities. Despite the extremely challenging financial position, I have been able to allocate just over £1 million to road safety communications, grants and educational materials. And I was then able to supplement this further through subsequent monitoring rounds, securing funds for two new campaigns that are referred to earlier, and I identify those as priorities. However, there is still a significant reduction in my department's road safety budget, and that is most regrettable, given the rise in road deaths last year and recent analysis, which indicates that the economic recovery that we hear about, some of us don't see that much of it, but that will make our work to reduce road deaths even more challenging. Call Mr. Sammy Douglas. Question number four, Mr. Principal, Deputy Speaker. My department's role is largely limited to provision of advice and guidance to members of the public on dealing with Japanese knotweed on their land. My department has no legal powers to force a landowner to undertake control of Japanese knotweed on their land. However, I do recognise that there is an increasing problem presented by the spread of Japanese knotweed. I have therefore tasked my officials with carrying out an analysis of the scale of the problem and outlining some options for further discussion with executive colleagues, and this is to be completed by the end of this month. Mr Douglas, for a quick supplementary. I thank Mr Principal Deputy Speaker. I thank the Minister for his answer so far. Um, the Minister uh, may be aware that in England and Wales um, have attempted to deal with the failure to control the spread of invasive non-native plants using anti-social behaviour orders. Does the Minister feel that the current legislation is strong enough to deal with this problem right across Northern Ireland? Minister, for a quick answer. I, I thank the, the member for that question. And while Japanese not, we don't indeed other invasive species are hard to control and, and quite unruly. I find it quite interesting that in England they'd introduced ASBOs to, to, to deal with them. However, they, they do have that so that they can bring a landowner to a book should they not take uh, measures to control the spread of Japanese knotweed maybe to a neighbouring property. 
One thing they do have there, the, in addition to that ASPO power, is a species control order which gives power to relevant authorities to enter into agreements with landowners to eradicate invasive species. And in extreme circumstances, these SCOs provide powers to certain bodies to undertake work themselves and then re recoup the costs. And like I said, my officials are currently looking at a range of options, and I'd certainly be encouraging them to ensure that that is one. That ends the period for listed questions. We now move on to 15 minutes of topical questions. I call Mr. Raymond McCartney. Thank you very much, uh, Principal Deputy Speaker. Can, can, can I ask the Minister, in relation to uh, recent no flooding experiences, and in particular issues around both uh, damage and prevention, has the Minister any plans to, to seek additional resources, and, and could he give us any indication where those resources may come from? I thank the member uh, for that question. Clearly, the issue of flooding is one that has been extremely uh, topical over a number of weeks. And, and just yesterday, I took the opportunity to visit the victims of flooding and my colleague, uh, Ms. Kelly's constituency, who just as of yesterday ceased to be underwater. These were businesses impacted upon by the flooding. With regards to assistance available to the victims of, of floods, my department retains responsibility for the Emergency Financial Assistance Scheme, which is administered through councils, and that offers a £1,000 sort of emergency payment to householders who have been uh, badly impacted upon by flooding. And the latest bout of flooding, if you want to call it that, say from the start of December, 112 households right across the north have been impacted upon and are or have been in the receipt of that payment, which enables them to make their property habitable again as soon as possible without having to wait for an insurance cost uh, or, or claim to go through. The member is quite right. I have sought to extend uh, I suppose the assistance that is available not just to householders but to businesses, to community facilities and to churches because there is currently no legislative cover to do that. In, in, in the scheme as it is. I submitted a paper seeking to do so to the Executive in November 2014. Uh, I was delighted last week when the Executive <laughs> decided to explore the possibility of extending the Emergency Financial Assistance Scheme to businesses. What we do have to do now is to ensure that that also extends to uh, churches and community facilities as well. McCartney for supplementary. Thank you very much, Principal Deputy Speaker, and can I thank the Minister for that a comprehensive reason or answer. In relation to additional resources, I'm wondering in terms of the plastic bag levy which the Minister has used for environmental projects in the past, would that be something he could examine to use in the future perhaps for preventative measures? I, th I thank the member for that question. When it comes, to th this is something again where the fragmentation of approach between different d departments uh, causes a slight problem. However, I think there is a tremendous opportunity given that the restructuring of departments uh, post-election will put DOE and DARD, or our functions, uh, largely together. DARD currently are the lead when it comes to flood prevention measures and indeed I would commend uh, Minister O'Neill for the scheme she launched around individual property protection which will enable homeowners and I believe it's to be extended to business as well, business owners to avail of a grant in order to make their properties more flood proof. I think it's imperative that we do look at prevention rather than response. And the more that we spend on prevention and the earlier that we, or mitigation and the earlier that we spend that, the less it would needed, or be needed to be spend, uh, spent in terms of response, clean up and any type of compensation or what might be perceived as compensation. With regards to the carrier bag levy, within legislation there are strict enough sort of parameters on what it can be spent. It has to be spent on projects which benefit the environment directly, and while flood mitigation measures would certainly benefit one's environment if one lives in a house that's uh, prone to flooding, I'm not sure it would actually tick the boxes uh, to be eligible for 
Fountain from the Bukhaya Baglevy scheme. Question number two has been withdrawn. I call Mr McKinney. Thank you, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker. Um, I kind of thank the Minister, who will be aware of uh, greenway areas in Belfast which afford people uh, opportunities for recreation and access uh, to the city, alternative access to the city by walking or cycling. Suggestions are now coming from a community group, uh, the Carrie Duff Regeneration Forum, that such capacity could exist in that part of Belfast. And could the Minister reflect on the value of developing a greenway in that area? I thank the, the member for that question. This is another one that would probably be best directed towards another minister or another department, given that DRD would be the department with responsibility for uh, greenways, etc. However, that won't prevent me, nor should it prevent me, from speaking about the benefits of greenways, because they are so cross-cutting and wide-ranging. Uh, first and foremost, I think greenways provide a safe environment for people to I suppose get about living active lifestyles for people to go walking, running and cycling, which has huge benefits for people's mental as well as physical health. It also works wonders, I suppose, for social engagement opportunities. And I know uh, if you were to walk along the new newish greenway in my own constituency, it'd be amazing how many people you meet and how you Many people need to stop and chat. At least that's my excuse why it takes me so long to, to run a lap of it. Uh, of, the, the benefits go even further than that, I believe, if a greenway is constructed and managed and marketed correctly, and that they can actually have real tourism benefits uh, for, for areas. We haven't seen that much of that here in the north yet, but if you look uh, to the south of Ireland, or well, to the west of Ireland, in Mayo, a real kind of tourism industry that's built up along the Greenway, basically, where it provides opportunities for, for small businesses, such as coffee shops and bars and restaurants, they open up. So, like I said, there are very, very many benefits uh, of these, and I'd be happy enough, I suppose, to meet with any group who'd be proposing uh, to, to establish one and see how or what assistance we could offer. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Principal De Deputy Speaker. I'm delighted to hear that the Minister himself knows the value of these. Of course, it's about capacity building as well in terms of how an organisation starts with the germination of an idea and, uh, and develops it. And in that context, could he also consider um, allowing his officials to liaise potentially with the Carried Off Regeneration Forum to at least potentially step the way through the process? I, I thank the member for that question as well, and as I, I, I said, I'd be uh, happy enough to meet with the group if I can get away with my officials doing it even better. But I, I, as I had said, it's primarily an issue or a, a function or responsibility associated with another department, that of, of regional development, and I, I'm sure the regional development minister would be happy enough. I don't want to speak for her, but for her uh, uh, officials to engage in such discussions as well. I know, I know her predecessor, uh, when, when he was Minister Danny Kennedy, this is uh, an area where he wanted to see huge advances and, and, and concentrate a, a lot of his time and efforts on. Question number four has been withdrawn. I call Ms Bradley. Principal Deputy Speaker, can I ask the Minister for an update on the Planning Appeals Commission decision uh, regarding the ARC 21 uh, residual waste treatment facility in the High Town Quarry? I thank you, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker, and, and I thank the, the member for that question. I haven't had an ARC question in, in a, a wee while. Well, the case is still with the Planning Appeals Commission. That was the decision of the applicant, and I believe with the support of the, the composite councils uh, what, what was to appeal my decision to refuse this incinerator. I have to say it's a decision that was uh, met with, I wouldn't say a claim, but uh, it was very positively received by uh, members of the public in the, member, the members' opposite constituencies. I, I, I think uh, it will be up for the PAC to determine as to whether I made the correct decision, but then ultimately well, they will make a report, and that, and that report will come back to myself or whoever will be a minister after me to, to make the final decision on them once more. Call Ms. Bradley for a supplementary. 
Thank you, Mr. Principal, Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Minister um, for his answer. In his answer, he had said that uh, he believed that support had been given by the, uh, the constituent councils. Um, that is not what I have been led to believe, but I, I could be wrong. Could he, and maybe he maybe doesn't have the information on him, but could he possibly get the information to us if he doesn't, uh, which councils did lend their support to this appeal? I, I thank the member for that question. Well, I would have been under the impression that it, it would not have proceeded without some uh, modicum of support from the, the composite councils. I do not have that information at hand and will certainly uh, find it. Like I say, it was something that came as a bit of a surprise to me when uh, the appeal did materialise, given the strength of feeling uh, among the public, and I am sure that would have been reflected to and then by elected members in, in all the affected council areas. Mr Campbell is not in his place. I call Ms Cameron. Mr. Principal, Deputy Speaker, um, uh, can I ask the Minister topical questions? Nothing more topical than the weather. And given that we have a yellow alert out for rain for Northern Ireland today, um, I want to follow on on the previous question around um, flooding. And I know the Minister has been on the ground and seeing um, the devastation for himself. Could, could he tell us a bit more about what practical, he's talked about the financial help, but what practical help um, is and will be given to victims of severe flooding in Northern Ireland? I thank the, the member for that question. Uh, I think, first and foremost, it, it's important that we do recognise that finally some help is to be given to victims that will go beyond uh, the £1,000 available in my emergency financial assistance scheme. But the detail of what that will be has yet to be decided. I know uh, the Dard Minister and DFP Minister are currently working up details on that which I'm sure they'll be keen to, to finalise and share as early as possible. Uh, I, I'm involved also in, in, in that and will use, I suppose, my own experience or feedback of what I have been hearing from people in, in the ground to input into that and hopefully help shape uh, th their response. I know in particular some of the businesses that I visited, not just yesterday, but I did visit once yesterday in the Upper Ban, and they felt particularly let down by all of us collectively. As government, I got that message pretty loud and pretty clear yesterday. We do look again, I think, or need to look at other jurisdictions and see how they have responded uh, to flooding crises in, in, in their areas, and I think we might have a lot to learn from them. Well, Ms. Cameron, for supplementary. Thank you, and I thank the Minister for his answer um, so far. Can the Minister give his assurance that listed buildings affected by flooding will receive urgent and adequate assistance from his department um, in order to ensure that our uh, built heritage is preserved for future generations? I thank the member uh, for that question. It's actually quite pertinent, I suppose, given a question or a series of questions that had been asked earlier during question time property or proper around the importance of our built heritage. And I, I know reference had been made by a couple of members earlier to a building in McGilligan on Seacoast Road, which has now got an awful state of repair attached to college, which is and should be of tremendous value. I visited a similar cottage in uh, Upper Ban yesterday, a 300-year-old cottage that has been severely uh, flooded. I think it's important that we look at what measures could be taken to ensure that it will be protected from any uh, type of, of such incident in the future. It's important, I suppose, that we do everything we can to protect all homeowners or, 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 or dwellers. But I think it's particularly important that we take what steps we can to protect buildings of that age and historic importance. Question number eight has been withdrawn. I call Mr Little. Thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker. Can I ask the Minister why Northern Ireland is the only region in these islands without climate change legislation? I uh, thank the member for that question. He probably wasn't expecting to get there. I, I wasn't either, but so he, he dug out an old one. It's a, a cause of, of some regret to, to me that uh, we here in the north don't have climate change uh, legislation. I, I think I'd been quoted previously as saying, or in fact I did say on a radio interview, that we should be a wee bit embarrassed about the fact that we don't. I said that in advance 
of going to the COP21 negotiations in, in Paris, where I took the opportunity to speak to uh, ministers, to speak to people uh, from all other jurisdictions around climate change legislation in their respective uh, jurisdictions or countries. And I think that was a very valuable thing to do. And it made me come back with quite a different view on this, because in some areas where they do have climate change legislation, they'll point to it and say, ah, if we were to do it again, we would do it differently. So sometimes there might be an advantage in going last and we'll be able to cherry pick from other uh, jurisdictions what works well where and what doesn't work so well. Obviously, of course, then we'll be faced with the challenge of getting the executive and then the assembly to agree on climate change legislation. That won't be an easy task. The member has sat in here in numerous debates on the topic, I'm sure. However, I don't think it will be an impossible task either. And we just have to look at the success of the COP21 uh, uh, conference in securing a historic agreement where you have people with views much more disparate than Stephen Agnew and Sammy Wilson even sitting down and being able to make an agreement, reach an agreement for the common and greater good. Time is up. That concludes question time. I invite the members to take their ease while we change the top table.